but I think some very positive signs are beginning to appear. I think we're starting to realize that we'd better remember what got us this far if we expect to go any farther. So I'm going to tell you where the word character comes from, and I'd hope it has as big an effect on you as it did on me. But first I want to just quickly mention the origins of another word that people often confuse with character, just to clarify the differences. That other word is charisma, and I think that it's often confused with character today. Charisma is derived from a Greek word meaning an ability to elicit favor in other people. It's a magnetic quality of personality that people respond to as if it were magic. Charisma is almost like a magic wand that confers power over others. But character has a very different origin. Character comes from a Greek word meaning chisel or the mark left by a chisel. And of course a chisel is a sharp steel tool used for making a sculpture out of a hard or difficult material like granite or marble. And a chisel is also used for stripping away waste material from an object, stripping away stuff that might get in the way in order to get down to the essential thing, the thing that really matters. So in its origins, the word character isn't related to a word like charisma, which we've described as a kind of magic wand. Character isn't a magic wand. And I hope you'll remember that. You've got to chisel your character out of the raw material of yourself, just like a sculptor has to create a statue. The raw material is always there. Everything that happens to you, good or bad, is an opportunity for building your character. You may have noticed it already. In both its definition and its derivation, character doesn't refer to other people. It doesn't refer to having power over other people or getting other people to follow you or gaining favor with other people. Character is something that you have and that you are. You could be marooned on a desert island and your character would still be important. In fact, it would likely be very important in that situation. But charisma wouldn't do you any good at all. Charisma requires the presence of others while character is all about you. Character is the person you are after you've chiseled and chiseled and have gotten past all the unnecessary material to what's underneath. A really charismatic person can make people believe there's pie in the sky or that the sky is going to fall tomorrow, one just as easily as the other. By creating these expectations, charismatic individuals can indeed energize and inspire others or terrify and demotivate them until the overblown scenarios are proven false and the charisma runs out. But a person of character doesn't need to be anyone's Pied Piper. I believe in bliss and satisfaction. Have you ever bitten into like a great steak and went, oh my gosh, it's delicious. Have you ever had that happen, yes or no? Did it make you not want the next bite more? Or did you want it more? See, there's a part of your brain, there's serotonin in your brain. The more you celebrate your win, you celebrate when you're here, you have fun along the way, it begins to train your brain you want to go to the next level. But if you cheat yourself from the celebration, you cheat yourself from the joy, it's always just a grind. Eventually there's this thing called frying and burnout where your brain doesn't want to do it anymore because it's not pleasurable, it gets no dopamine hit, no serotonin hit, and it wants to stop. You have to be blissfully dissatisfied. I talk about this in one of my audios and my book. My wife's a great example of this. We're complete opposites. I'm running out of time. I'm a super uh, aggressive achiever. My wife, I call my wife, she's easy happy, easy satisfied. If we were living in a log cabin in the middle of nowhere, but we could cuddle up all day long and kissy kissy, she'd be happy all day long. She wears jeans and t-shirts. She could care less about material things. She could not tell you within um, many decimal points how much money we have. I don't even sure she knows other than Bank of America where any of the money is, could care less about it. She just loves people, loves life. She's the daughter of a pastor, brother's a pastor. She's just a happy person. And she's married to a complete psychopath. But my wife, we've been together for a long time. She's developed some, I love my wife, but I don't like her all the time. The longer any of you that have been in a long-term marriage here, they start doing some crap, man, that you just drives you crazy. Anybody relate to that? Yes or no? My wife has developed this very bizarre habit. I'm not sure how it started or where it started, but when she eats pleasurable food, she moans orgasmically. So we'll be eating lasagna at the house, kids at the table, and she just started this a few years ago, and she doesn't even know she's doing it. We'll be eating, how was school today, great, say the prayer, and then, mm -hmm. or like, I'm serious, or like, she's eating a brownie, mm -hmm. 
Mm. I'm like, that is so weird. Stop it in front of the kids. What is wrong with you? She's like, what am I doing? I'm like, I don't want to even tell you, but like, it's really uncomfortable. Stop it. She's like, it just, it tastes so good. I'm like, babe, we got it. Stop. But she doesn't know she's doing it. So my son's birthday happens. We're at this restaurant and she's hot. My wife's super hot, right? And so, and I say that being married a long time, he's hot, dude. And so we literally walk into this place and there's some dudes checking her out and I'm Italian and I was in a bad mood and you shouldn't look at my wife more than about one time, right? So these guys look at me and my kids know now that I've become a public person, I've gotten better at this stuff. But like you, you get to look at her once, maybe twice. You turn around with a whole table full of people and come slap the shit out of you, right? Excuse my language. So these guys are looking at her a little bit too long and they're on the edge. They didn't know it, but they're about to get slapped. They didn't, you know what I'm talking about guys, right? They didn't know it, but it was getting close. You do it again, I'm gonna smack you. Sure enough, we're at their table next to them. Her steak comes, takes the first bite. So she goes, what am I doing it? I'm like, yes, you're doing it. My daughter's like, mom, you're doing it. Sure enough, a few minutes later, this is embarrassing as hell. I can't even go slap these guys. These dudes are literally losing their minds, right? So we leave the dinner, we get home, we're getting ready to do what married people do after a night out. She's in the bed and I go, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go upstairs and grab a steak. And I'm throwing this thing in his bed with us because I've never heard you make these kind of noises before. So we're throwing this steak in the mix, right? She's like, and she literally says to me, she goes, it's just so blissful. And I'm like, that's a training because I'm dissatisfied and you're blissful. And I'm gonna tell you something. There's a lot of validity. You need to learn to be in bliss as you're dissatisfied. That bliss will cause you want to take neck bite, neck haul, neck, neck bite in. At that same dinner, my daughter said to me, hey dad, my daughter's pretty, like she's like me. My son's a sweetie like his mom. My daughter goes, hey dad, what's up with the midlife crisis? You saw the video, I go, midlife crisis? What are you talking about? She goes, come on, social media, you're growing the beard out, the tight t-shirts, you're going through a midlife crisis. And I go, you know what? You're right, I am. Here's what you don't know. I was going through a young life crisis. When daddy was 20 years old, I was going through a crisis to get to the next level at 21. I was going through a crisis when I was 28 to be better at 29. I was in a crisis when I was 35 to be a better version of me at 36. And guess what, boo? When daddy's 55, I'll be in another crisis before I get to 56. And that's a fact. Anybody that knows me, if you want to adopt one of my personality traits, I'm in a crisis to get to the next level. Talk to God often. Even if you're not perfect, just talk to him every day. You don't have to be in the same faith I'm in, or you ain't got to call God the same thing I call him. But listen to me, you do have to call him, though. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. The voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. And guys, I believe that's true in my life, and it's, and it's true in your life, that there's a lot of things that are calling out to you, there's shame that's calling out to you. There's not enough. There's insecurities. There's, but I'm not as good as this person. But look at all the bad things I've done. But, but God, I, I can't get up there and speak or I, I don't have a voice like Hillsong. What can I do? But then we remember the voice of truth. God's promises on my life. God's promises on your life. That I'm a child of God, a son of the king, the king of the world, who will forever reign. I was created in love, by love, and for love. He has an amazing plan for my life. Those voices of truth would say, I'm here for a reason. I might not be enough, but I'm more than conquerors through him that loved me. So when I know I'm going to get scrutinized, I know I'll either win or lose. I know I'll be a hero or the goat. I also know it doesn't matter because the God of this universe he formed me in my mom's womb and he said through me you're more than enough and i love you no matter what and i have a perfect plan for your life in your life wherever you are whatever you're doing are you going to show the people around you your confidence in the lord you see they might see it on your best day they might see it when you leave church they might see it when you leave passion dang i'm so confident in the lord it's awesome i just got to hear Hillsong band, I got to hear passion, I got to hear Louie, I can express my confidence in the Lord. What about your worst days? What about your Mondays? What about when you get cut? Oh, hey, wait, that happened to me over and over again. What about when they say you're not good enough to do what you want to do? What about when you can't find that right person that you want to spend the rest of your life with? Do you still express confidence in the Lord? Because when we really want to have an impact on the rest of the world, then we're gonna still have the same confidence in the Lord on our worst day that we have on our best day. You know, it was, it was easy for me when I won championships in this stadium to say, hey, I wanna thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it's really hard when you get cut or you get traded or they say you're not good enough to say, you know what? I wanna thank 
my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to still express my confidence in Him. Because a few verses later in verse number 13, we learn, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that doesn't mean that you can accomplish anything you want. If you're 5'5", five five, you're probably not going to be in the NBA. But it does mean wherever God puts you, wherever you're at in life, He's going to give you the strength through Him to handle it, to conquer it, because you are more than conquerors through Him that loved you. So you might think, I'm in a tough time. I don't know how I'm going to get through. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm going to express my confidence in Him. No matter if I just won the championship or I'm in the basement and I'm tied up and I don't know how much longer I have to live.